Hi there. Uh, I'm Bart Weiss. I'm the founder and director of the Dallas Video Festival. And this year we're having some Google online hangouts with some of the filmmakers who have really wonderful films at our festival. Um, and um, so uh, it's a chance for you um, to get to meet uh, our, our, our filmmakers. And today we have a filmmaker of, of, of a really lovely special movie that we're showing, Flory's Flame and Ellen is here to talk about the film. So Ellen, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Thanks for being, allowing me to be here. Yeah, it's fun. It's, it is a lot of fun. So Ellen is not new to our uh, video festival in, in environment. You had a film with us how many years ago? Um, I think 2011, so four. Four years four ago. Years ago. And Delicious Peace was, you know, just an, an amazingly wonderful movie. Um, it's a movie that has um, resonated very dip, deeply with me. Um, do you want to describe it for, for our audience here? Yeah, sure. Uh, Delicious Peace, which I remember you uh, saying at the film festival was one of the longest, the actual title was one of the longest titles that <laughs> you had ever seen. It was called Delicious Peace Grows in a Ugandan Coffee Bean. And it was about a cooperative of farmers who were Christian, Jewish, and Muslim and had historically been at odds with one another who decided to form a coffee cooperative with the two goals of both economic development but also uh, developing more peaceful relationships between each other. And then they partnered with a fair trade coffee buyer in the United States, in Northern California, and by getting good wages for their coffee, actually life got better. And when life got better, it, it definitely improved their relationships. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of an amazing thing to see um, commerce um, really working to develop peaceful relationship with people who generally did not um, sort of um, like each other. And it really did kind of show a path for hope. Um, which is like an amazing thing in and of itself. But the the thing that was really odd is, so okay, I know this film very well. You know, I watched it several times. And then I got this book in the mail. You know, I teach Final Cut Pro 10. And <laughs> um, so in one of the, you know, there's like a DVD with some like sample files to show you how to do it. And my God, there's a scene from the movie in there. Exactly. They use that as their examples. <laughs> so I assume you got paid nicely for that? Well, um, we, we made an arrangement with them. <laughs> so um, before we start talking about the, the film, you know, being a documentary filmmaker is a really hard thing to do to, to make a living. I think you found a nice balance um, in your life and in your work to make good films that are very human and also find a way to make a living um, and not teach, which is my path. So you wanna talk about how you balance your life? Sure, we, so we actually have two uh, video production companies. One is nonprofit through which we make documentaries mm -hmm. and the other is a corporate video production company. Um, and our specialty there actually um, pr the private equity industry. Hmm. investment industries and I, so we we work with um, private equity companies to showcase for their marketing purposes or investor relations purposes some of the companies that they hold so actually it's I mean we we love that work because of course it pays I mean their clients they expect to pay but besides that um, it's almost like doing little three-minute documentaries on these small, small mom and pop companies around the world. Mm -hmm. So it's you great. Get... It's, it, it's very similar in a way to making documentaries except that they're short and there's very quick turnover so we don't live with um, all the difficulties of production over a three or four year period of making a doc like making a documentary. Um, so, so let's talk about Flory's Flame. Um, where did you get the idea for this? When did you see her perform and realize that this was like an important story for you to spend three or four years working with? 
So actually, I had heard Plory first perform something like 20 years ago. Her daughter, Betty, lives in the town where I live in Montclair, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So uh, Flory has been up here to, to perform over the years. And the very first time I heard her, I was mesmerized. I loved her music. I loved her soul and her spirit and what she was trying to do to continue this tradition of music that stretches back for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. So and stop there for a second. Mm -hmm. Now that we're up to that, why don't you talk about this kind of music that she's trying to preserve? There she is preserving. Sure. So I'm sorry. So so I'm sorry. It goes, you know, this Google Hangout goes a little in and out of my computer. So sometimes I might step on you, and I don't mean to. No, it's okay. It's good. It's it's, it's just a conversation. So go on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically, um, Flory's Flory Jagoda, whose maiden name was um, Flory Alteras, was part of a Sephardic family, meaning Judeo Spanish Jewish Judeo Spanish family. Um, so that stretched back to Spain uh, for hundreds of years before 1492, which was the time of the Inquisition. So Jews lived very happily, very comfortably in Spain for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and then the Inquisition came, which is when they had no choice but basically to give up their religion or leave or die. So um, Flory came from a family of minstrels forever, just going back generation after generation after generation. Incredibly talented musicians who composed their own music, who wrote their music, but of course in all the local traditions of Spain for all of that time. So when her family left Spain during the Inquisition, they carried their music with them. They carried their musical traditions with them. They carried the language of that, the, um, the, 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 you know, so they went from Turkey and then from Turkey into the Balkans where a lot of Jews went. They were in Sarajevo, um, once called Chico Yerushalayim, a very important center for, for Jews for a long time. And her family left Sarajevo and lived it right in the outside skirts of it. But when she was growing up, she once said to me, um, it's, this wasn't a line in the movie, but she said this to me. She said, you know, many families, most families sit at dinner tables during the day. Our family sat at the dinner table and sang. So since she was a really little girl, she was imbibing the music and she was incredibly naturally talented. It didn't take anything for her to really learn it. It was just, you know, it, it well. So she learned this music when she learned to walk and talk essentially and it was it became part of her. So music and now it's she for oh, explains God. throughout the course of the documentary now she's the sole person left to continue that tradition. So that's been her objective is to teach other people so that when she's gone because she's now 92, or she will be in December, um, she wants to make sure that that music still continues to live on. And it's amazing to um, to see her perform and to see this, you know, the sort of music sort of continue on. You know, who knows when we're 92, how much we're going to be able to sort of um, accomplish. So what is the, the sort of challenges of working with a subject who is you know, 92 years old or 90 and, um, you know, keeping them you know, like, like going. I mean, she's got, you know, she's wonderful, but I'm sure as a documentarian, that's, that's a kind of a challenge. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a little challenge. I mean, she lives in Washington, D.C. We're from New Jersey, so that was really nice for us as compared to traveling to Uganda, for example, where every time <laughs> something would arise, we had to go far away. So in many respects, whatever challenges there were here were very few compared to a lot of the long-distance type of documentaries we've produced. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there were times we'd get down there. For instance, one time we went to interview her after a holiday. I don't remember if it was Hanukkah or Passover or, or uh, 
a holiday that she'd made a huge party and the whole family and her friends came and because she still does that. She cooks like crazy. She has lots of people to the house and always with a, a, a music um, kind of informal production performances going on. Um, and then she's tired. And you know, when you're 92, you're probably a lot more tired after a big party than you are when you're, you know, a lot younger than that. So True. those were some of the challenges. We'd plan to go down on a day and she'd be exhausted. And so she, after an hour or two hours of interviewing, you know, she'd say, look, I'm, I'm just tired. So, you know, that was, that was the biggest challenge. Overall, very few, I'd say. So in, in that case, do you, um, do you just say, okay, we're done for today? Or you just say like, um, we'll just stay in, in DC for the day. Can we come back tomorrow? And, um, or do you just sort of like walk away? No, that's we, what we'd say is, okay, no problem. We'll stay here today and, you know, let's see how you feel tomorrow. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely what we did. Is we did that on you know a few times, but not much. I, I would say for the most part. I mean, I think it's really hard to be interviewed also, and to know when you're being interviewed for a documentary, it's, it's not like a little hangout that we're having right now. You know, you yeah, want, you look good. It's you know going to be played in front of a lot of people for a long time to come. You know, you're a little bit about it. So after. A good two hours, she'd get really tired, which is understandable, I think. Mm -hmm. So we almost always went down for at least two days in a row. Oh, well, yeah, that's that's rather smart. Of course you'd want to do that. Um, so uh, talk about the performance that you shot along with that, along with the film, and um, what you were trying to do with that and why that performance. Yeah, that was that was incredibly powerful and very, very, very exciting. So basically, Flory, Flory is a National Heritage Fellow, which is an honor given by the National Endowment of the Arts to very few um, artists each year, very few. It's, it's a very rare honor to be able to get, and Flory's gotten that. So to, mm -hmm. to, have, to talk about being a musician is one thing. To show how you're a musician was, we always thought, the documentary. We would, she would need to be performing in a way that gave gravitas to these awards that she's received and the respect that she's had over the years, um, have been officially recognized for, but also even other musicians have, um, you know, recognized her for. So we always knew that a key part of this documentary was going to have to be a major concert. And so some of the musicians who perform with her started to to different people that they knew um, and the Library of Congress said you know we want to do this uh, you know the Library of Congress has worked with her in the past I mean again as she's an NEA winner you know so it, it, all these things are very connected and they felt that it would be a real honor for them to have Flory perform there and of course doing a concert in the halls of the Library of Congress where again very few musicians some of the top musicians in the world have only performed was a was documentary great honor for her fantastic for the documentary so um, she put together or the folks who work with her put together a um, a concert with 25 people on stage, different musicians who performed with her throughout her life, the Library of Congress um, a hall where they had the concert was sold out. There were over 500 seats. And it was a very powerful and moving concert. We also had the um, ambassador from um, the ambassador and another person from the uh, from the embassy of Croatia and also somebody from uh, the embassy of, of uh, Bosnia there so you know they and as I remember the one of the representatives from the government of Croatia said that he had been in the United States for quite a while but had never felt so much like he was at home as he did that night hmm. so um, what was the challenge of shooting in that space how many cameras did you have I mean it's like you're doing this documentary, it's this very personal thing, and then you have this very sort of public event that's like like this one-time shot that you have to sort of, you know, really capture in a way. So what was your thinking and strategy going in, and what did you do to make that happen? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, first of all, we 
for Lou because they said that there are no more than three cameras that are allowed in here. Oh. So um, it's a relatively condensed space. So um, by putting cameras in a few different spots, like on the left and the right sides, we were taking up seats from people who could have been there. And for them, the focus was not on the documentary, it was on the concert. Sure. So we weren't allowed to have more. So basically we got a team together of folks in DC, um, you know, who this spot and like spots and, um, you know, and, and that's what we did. We got three different camera people in those different spots and um, Kurt also had another camera and kind of walked around and tried to get some visuals from his shoulder. But for the most part, we were using three basic cameras. So um, what did you personally learn from spending time with this really, um, you know, just wonderful soul, a very, you know, inspiring character? And how has she changed your life? Um, you know, Flory, Flory was through so much in her life, and, and, and I don't want to talk about the details of that because that's part of the story that I want everybody who's watching this to see. So, um, but, but it's, it's a p very powerful personal story of her life as well, and she was able to get through all of it by, by art, by music, by her love of those things, by her, her love of people, by never feeling um, this sense that bad overwhelms good, by always being optimistic and hopeful and passing that on. And that is such a beautiful, strong thing to hold on to because as a result of all of that, she's been able to be so um, successful in doing something that one would think is it's counterintuitive I mean to take music that goes back thousands of years and to be the only person in the world who can pass that on and to be successful in doing that because you're so committed to it because you love it so much because because you don't let other obstacles get in your way is amazing I mean um, almost everyone that we talk to because we talk to a lot of other people who've performed with her they like to people around holiday season you know if you go into a Starbucks if you if you're listening to the radio and they're playing holiday music and they insert a Jewish uh, a Jewish song or, or the litany of music that comes up very frequently it's her song Ocho Candelicas nobody knows that that was Flory's song yeah. she's never cared about copywriting anything what she cares about is having the stuff continue to live and it is, and people don't even know that they have to, it's like row, row, row your boat. I mean, is that copyrighted? I think I could probably sing that and not have to worry about a copy or some other song that's really old. But the point is with hers, there is no copyright because it has to live on, and it is. Yeah, you know, uh, as we speak, you know, um, Happy Birthday just came into the public domain. So that's one that uh, is like that. I didn't even know that it wasn't. I bet a lot of people didn't know that it was. Oh, for a long time, you had to pay these two ladies a whole lot of money, and this was a long court case. Um, I recently, a few years ago, did a documentary about the um, the temple I belong to. Temple Emmanuel has this incredible choir that has done amazing things. And at one point, um, they're singing in a mall, and they sing Ocho Candelinas. So oh, I, really? So I have that footage if you'd like to see it at some point. <laughs> it's actually yeah, very Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yes, I would, I would really like to see it. I mean, you know, it's funny because this film played um, last year in the Jerusalem Film Festival. Yes, a wonderful festival, an absolutely wonderful place to be, to be at a festival. Yes, how great. Yeah, I, we weren't there for it, but a good friend of mine went, and she video, you know, with her with her iPhone, she videotaped before the film started. There was a woman in the audience who got on stage and started performing some of Flory's songs. You wow. know, so it, people just people who know this kind of music know it. They just know it, and they love it, and they perform it. You know, so it was really kind of exciting to see. Here was a random person who knew the music and was performing. Oh, that's really kind of wonderful. Well, um, 
Um, this was really kind of great. I think uh, everybody will understand and you know, like be more anxious and wonderful and excited to come out and see the film. Is, is there anything else you want to you want to talk about about the film that, w that we didn't talk about that you think somebody should absolutely know before they see the film? Um, I think the film has has this incredible energy to it that's driven by who the character is. You know, we, we were fortunate to get a, a really good distributor, international distributor of all kinds of films. And when I asked them, why did you want to accept this film? You know, this is not your typical kind of film. The answer was, when we showed it around here, everybody fell in love with Flory. Yeah. And I think that's the feeling of it. She, she has this remarkable... Um, beautiful soul and it's expressed through her music which is so special so I think I think that's that's what we were really trying to capture was the feeling of of her and the skin kind of in combination with each other and then to to play a role in preserving that music because the documentary will always be able to do that yeah, and, and, you know, I, we can talk about how wonderful she is and how, like, when you watch the film, you feel good. And it's like, it's a wonderful thing to watch a movie and feel good. But also the filmmaking is done in a really kind of beautiful way, which is what you always hope when you have this wonderful spirit that the filmmaker faking rises to sort of help you have that wonderful experience. And, and, it, and it truly is. You know, sometimes you watch a film and you get depressed afterwards. This one makes you feel good about the world. Oh, thank you, Bart. That's so sweet of you to say. And uh, so the film will be showing the last day at our festival, which is October 18th. And it'll be co-presented with Three Star Cinema, the Jewish film series that I also program. Um, and um, I know that people will be really happy they came and have a wonderful experience with the film. Um, so, so Ellen, thank you for spending your your Sunday morning, Sunday early afternoon with us. I, I hope you have a, a really great day, and that um, um, thank you for sharing this film and for taking time to craft this beautiful film. Well, but, thank you it, so much, and thank you for your great festival. <laughs> I'm so excited to be there. Yeah, it's going to be great. It'll be. I said first, I'm hoping we'll be able to be there. At least, I is one I'm going to be a part of it. Um, I hope you can. We have some other really wonderful things that I think you will just really enjoy. Um, thanks so much, and, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, great. Thank All you, Bart. Right. All right, bye. bye.